distinguished invited speakers, very valuable invited speakers, Professor Jan Gail, Professor Jana Revedin, Ms. Marie Helen Contal, dear guests, dear participants, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Chamber of Architects of Turkey. The Chamber of Architects and with the partnership of the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture program, we have organized two very important conferences under the title Designing with People. Today, we are here together for our first conference. We wish we were together face to face, of course. But seeing the glass half full, actually, we have the opportunity now to have so many participants from Turkey and from different countries all around the world, which means actually that we will be and in larger circles. As I have mentioned before, these conferences have been realized with the support of the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture program, which has a very special and a unique uh, value just because of the innovative approach and the philosophy in architecture today. The program, established in 2006, has an important role in emphasizing the social and cultural context the local contributions and participatory approach in architecture and urban planning. Every year, five outstanding architects, planners, thinkers, researchers, under the same frame of sustainable architecture. Our introductory speakers will give you more information on that. The three valuable keynoters of our program, actually Professor Jan Gehl, Professor Anne Feenstra and Marta Makalia next week. Uh, they are also the laureates of the Global, Global Award for Sustainable Architecture Program. As the board of the Chamber of Architects of Turkey, we brought the idea to share and to, to spread the remarkable approaches of these valuable laureates. Firstly, as we believe that we need their ideas for today's architecture and architectural criticism. And further, we want to put the focus on the role of the architect and architecture today and to promote social, cultural research and certainly democracy and equity in architecture and public space. Our keynote, Professor Jan Gehl, is one of the laureates in 2015. He is the founding partner of the Gale Architects, as you all know, and as well as an emeritus professor of the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts. Today, the title of his speech will be Livable Cities for the 21st Century. In his lecture, he will describe why designing with people is crucial for livable, sustainable, and healthy cities and spaces of our century as is also broadly discussed in his very well-known book, Cities for People. I would like to add here that this book, valuable book, has been translated into Tur Turkish recently in last December by Erdem Erten and published by the Koch University Publishing. And we will be sharing the link of the book for those who are interested in uh, under our chat pages. Before our keen author, we have very special guests as introductory speakers. Professor Jana Levedin is the founding president of the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. And she is also currently a professor at the Ecole Speciale d'Architecture in Paris. And also she is an important delegate of UNESCO. And of course, Ms. Marie-Hélène Contal, who is the director of the Department of Cultural Development in Cité d'Architecture et de Patrimoine in Paris who is organizing this award program. They shortly will share their, their ideas on today's architecture, the scope of social architecture, inform us about the mentioned award program. So before concluding my words, on behalf of the board of the Chamber of Architects of Turkey, I kindly would like to thank once again to our keynote, Professor Jan Gail, and to our introductory speakers, Professor Jana Ravidin and Marie-Hélène Contal for accepting our invitation and being with us here today in these very difficult times. I'm also thankful to all who take part here.
in this scene. And many thanks to our organizing committee, of course, especially to us, the Tunjar, and to all who contributed and supported this process, and also to our interpreters. I wish you all a very fruitful and successful conference. And once again, I greet you all on behalf of the Chamber of Architects of Turkey. Thank you so much. Now I would like to leave the floor to our introductory speakers. Firstly, firstly to Professor Yana Levedin. She will share her thoughts. Thank you so much. Please, Yana Levedin. Thank you very much, Denise. Can you hear me? The microphone? Yes, yes. Thank you, Asli, to start, who is organizing all our technical conferencing, which is not so easy, but we are happy, very, very happy to meet again. I have had the honor to be in Istanbul in Mimar Sinan University and in the Chamber of Architects only two years ago. Thank you again for being able to meet. Thank you, Jan, to have accepted, accepted this invitation and to Marie-Hélène to be with us also. Uh, I speak to you, dear Denise. And by the way, Denise is not only my professor colleague at Mimar Sinan and an architect, but also member of the scientific committee of the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. So she is an important figure in the game of choosing every year those five uh, exceptional architects. Uh, I, I greet you very much, Denise. Um, please, Asli, give us my, give me my first slide. I speak to you exceptionally, not from Venice, but from Paris, where we met this morning with my first year atelier. This is our school. It has not changed since 1865, the first architecture school, technical school and scientific school of architecture of France. We are still in the same buildings with the same garden. And my students are dressing up perfectly like the students in 1865. So thank you very much uh, to have made this possible, Denise, because my entire atelier is watching this, uh, this <laughs> conference from Jan Gehl. And mm -hmm. also, of course, the ones next week, the two conferences of our friends Anne Fenstra and Marta Macaglia. It's a first year group. Uh, Jan, you will like the topic that we do. I call it uh, the ergonomics of the human soul. We speak on psychology and I know that Jan has a very important influence in his life. His wife is a psychologist. So this is why he speaks on the human dimension of cities and of course of architecture. So this ergonomics of the human Soul will lead us to build little habitats of inclusion, first year experimentation. Also my diploma students are listening to us and also the doctoral uh, researchers. So thank you Jan for this occasion. I very shortly present where we are in this sitting in this Ecole Speciale. Uh, we are in collaboration with the campus of the design school, old, very old design school from France of the Ecole Camondo and the Fondation Cartier. Um, my teaching is very much based uh, on an approach of interdisciplinarity and transversality. Maybe, uh, Asli, if you give me the second slide, I was called from 10 years of uh, teaching and directing research, of course, in Sweden, here to Paris, because uh, my roots of reformatory thought and sustainable architecture and urban uh, design is the Bauhaus school. This is where I come from. I'm German. My family comes from, has its roots in the Republic of Weimar. And the three topics that the Bauhaus school invents or presents for architecture uh, 100 years ago is urban ecology. How do we make a city again after industrialization self-sufficient in working in a circular ecology and economy? How do we provide interdisciplinary learning. Architecture is one science between many most human touching and holistic sciences. And how do we uh, see, how do we prove that architecture is one possible motor of social empowerment? These was the ideas of the Bauhaus, but Gropius invited the, the greatest minority of, of humankind, the women to this career. So it was really a a new moment for architectural teaching. Uh, those are my keywords for the for the diploma students and for, of course, my doctoral 
research, you can find more on our website of the school and of course of my uh, architecture website. As I'm an architect and researcher, as Denise is, it is of course a model from many countries and many countries send their students to my school here in Paris that this is possible to combine architectural profession as of course an art and of course as a métier and research to not repeat ourselves in the many, many years of your future careers, my dear students and young colleagues who listen to us. And then the last slide, dear Asli, we uh, show you the 70 uh, laureates of the Global Award. Asli, if you maybe push, yes, here you have them all, 70 wonderful talents. Our aim is we give every year, and Jan, of course, knows this, as he knows the process, a certain theoretical topic. It is a theme that we give every year, and we choose in our uh, scientific, uh, in our scientific uh, board, but also receiving democratically propositions from architects or from critics or from architecture writers or from theorists. We choose five actual uh, innovative talents who work in the direction of this thematic uh, spot. And we try to mix big pioneers, big names like Jan Gehl, of course, is already. I cite you Balkrishna Doshi or Christopher Alexander, who was one of the theoretical, of course, roots of Jan's uh, work, as I know, or Thomas Herz, so great inventor of ecology. Uh, ecologic uh, te techniques uh, in Germany, or for example, uh, Frei Otto, who unfortunately passed away. So Werner Sobeck came in from the ELIC, the then following up uh, director of the TU uh, Stuttgart. Two of them in the new wave that the Pritzker Prize has taken since some years that we are operating with the Global Award by Krishna Doshi and Frei Otto have received in the meantime also the Pritzker Prize. But we try to mix them every year with young talents, totally unknown figures in the architectural scene. And there I can cite, for example, Alejandra Ravena from Chile or Wang Shu from China, who already have received the, the Pritzker Prize. Very young colleagues, my age, that means no, Denise, very young. <laughs> so sure. an architect ages well, as, as Jan is proving us. But also, for example, Francis Carey or Bonsam Premtada or Marta Macalia or Anne Fenstra that we will meet next week. So this is the aim of this prize to make them know, uh, to make them discuss between each other. We write together. Uh, we write not only on them, as Marilyn will approve uh, and approves every year, writing very actual and very very positive but also critical reports on their work but we write to i write together with them also thematically in thematic books that then my students read and i hope uh, also in turkey you once you will have them maybe translated to turkish language uh, and we do uh, experimental projects together and this is maybe the most touching and most uh, most revealing force uh, of this award uh, very luckily, uh, next year we will have the occasion on the Biennale of Versailles, the new architecture and landscape Biennale of Versailles, to have an exposition of three installations of three of my uh, laureates. So follow us up, and I pass the word to my dear friend Marie-Hélène Cantal. Just to make you know, in Paris, this award has landed from its beginning in 2006. And since then, and I think it's the longest cooperation we can imagine between a big institution that is the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine of, of, of the French Cultural Ministry and uh, a private activity that is mine. Uh, since 15 years, we push this award through uh, with all the problematics that means to finance it, to promote it, and of course, to make it be alive by content. So thank you, Marilyn, for all the support in the last 15 years. Thank you, Denise, to be my uh, most valuable scientific partner in the jury. And I pass the word to Marilyn Comtal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, dear Denise. Thank you, dear Jana. Hello to all. And thank you again to give me the great pleasure and honor 
to present today Jan Gale, and I will present Jan Gale as a researcher, a, an eminent professor, and a worldwide expert in how to restore public space and humanity. Uh, Jan Gale, who is aging very well, that's right, <laughs> Jan Gale has devoted his works, his entire works, to restoring the position of human at the heart of the organization of the city. How did he do it? He did it in being like a very few theorists, like Richard Sennett and Jan Gale, by example. So he did it in being, in having the courage, the courage, we say in France, to criticize the doctrine of functionalism and its consequences on the organization of cities. May I shortly read a quotation of Jan Gale? I read it. Modernism conceived the city as a machine whose elements were separated from one another in functional terms. A new group, transport and genus, became very, very important due to the theory about how to provide favorable condition to, to what? First of all, for circulating cars. During all those years, right, young Gale, Neither city planners nor engineers gave any importance to either urban space or to the life of citizen. End of the quotation. This quotation is from the most famous book of Jan Gale, Cities for People, published in 2010. Cities for People, Cities for People, excuse me, reached a global audience because Jan Gale has had rendered these works directly very accessible to citizen. Why? Why to why? Why, why do, do, do we have to write so clearly when you are, if you are experts? Because for Jan Gale, city and democracy are deeply linked. Quality of the public space is a matter of citizen. But for that, citizen have to have access to the right knowledge. May I? 50 years of works are now the heritage of Jan Gale. They made Jan Gale one of the forerunners of urban ecology too. He had principally devoted them to recreating the body of theory and practice regarding the dense city. This body of knowledge is based, and I will quote again Jan Gale, not on aerial views of cities, but on the perception and the measurement of human beings. Since 2000, Jan Gale created Great Gale Architects, uh, an office for carrying out studies which applies his method to the field of housing and city planning. His works, he works not through major projects, but through inflection in the metabolism of very big city like Stockholm, Oslo, New York, Paris, Moscow, Melbourne. His proposals are surpri surprising for, by their lightness. Moreover, Jan Gale considers that his method, conceived for the city of the North, are capable of being transposed to the megapoles of new countries. And may I read the last quotation of Jan Gale? The largest cities are always subdivided into small units with local identities. One can work at this scale to renovate existing system. Dear Professor Gale, thank you to be there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jana. Thank you so much, Marie Helen. Uh, just I would like to uh, I would like to emphasize that in this uh, Global Award for Su Sustainable Architecture program, one of our uh, architects, uh, Ersan Gürsel, uh, the Turkish uh, professional of ours, uh, has also been awarded in 2018, I guess, just uh, to inform uh, the Turkish uh, architects. And so we are so proud of that. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yes, dear Denise, may and I add it? It would be my final words. Yes, but I'm, I am very happy today to be the witness of a meeting between yes, two architects and city planner as engaged as uh, Jan Gale and Ersen Gürsel, of course. 
Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. And now I would like uh, to give the floor to our very valuable keynoter, Professor Jan Gale. And after his uh, presentation, we will have the possibility to have some questions or contributions. If we have some via chat, uh, Asla will organize that and uh, we will uh, finalize with his answers. Thank you so much. Once again, welcome Professor Gale and the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Here we are. I will start to share my screen. Okay. And hope it will work. <laughs> Ashley is here, no problem. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Not yet. We can try again. Here we are. That may be okay. Better. Okay. Here we go. Can you see? Yes, Professor. And you can hear and you can see and we really get airborne. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm very honored to be able to have this opportunity to address the Chamber of Turkish Architects uh, at this occasion. I have not had much professional dealings with Turkey yet, but I hope that it will be increasing now when one of my books have been published there. But today I'll start with a question. What if architecture could change the world? This is a, a t-shirt which I found in the Danish Architecture Center. I saw it at the first look of it. It was quite a silly question, but then I realized maybe it's a good question after all. I will try to address this question. Can we change the world as architects? We have over the past 50 years had a very great problem in city planning and architecture because by what we are doing, we have over the past 50 years done everything what is possible to chase the people out of our cities. And the background for this is, of course, the two major paradigms which have ruled planning and architecture uh, for the past 50 years. One is the modernism and the other one is a car invasion. And both of these really turned bad after 1960, when it was applied in very big measure in cities all over the world. First, I'll talk a little bit about the modernism. Because before the modernism, it's realized, it's important to realize that before modernism, all the cities were not made out of buildings, but out of spaces. The cities were made of spaces. And in these spaces, all the life of the cities were taking place. People were promenading. They were, they were having their markets. They were doing their processions with church processions. They were having court cases. They were having a passeggiata. They were having just small talk and meeting of people. Everything happened in the spaces. And also it was the connection between all the elements of the city, you can walk from one end to the other. So cities were made up of spaces always before modernism. If you look at the famous Nolly map of Rome, the city really here is seen as the city was seen at that point. It is presented as only made up of spaces of the buildings. You hear almost nothing here. If we think of the old cities we know, we can remember a lot of spaces. We can, rem this is Copenhagen, but it could be anywhere. We can remember many, many streets. 
We can remember many squares and parks. We can remember all the spaces, but among the buildings, we can only remember a few, the cathedral, the castle, the parliament, whatever important buildings, a few of them, but spaces. If we come to the modern, build, uh, how, uh, modern cities made by the modernists and after the, the introduction of the modernist way of thinking, suddenly the whole focus was moved from the spaces to the objects. And what not, was not built upon was leftover space. And if we look at, at cities today, what we can remember are certainly nine, never a space it is a number of, in many cases, rather funny buildings, its objects, its buildings. So this shift is very, very important. This shift from spaces for people to funny buildings is very, very important to understand because that has changed the world of homo sapiens extremely much. With this change, we had as a result, the modernists said that the city was a machine. Yeah, they may, they may be a machine, but the people are not machines. And these spaces which were left over after the objects were built were certainly not very nice for people to move in. And actually modernism represented a goodbye to concern for people and the social life in the cities because the spaces they left were unusable. Also, the modernist actually was a good back, goodbye to the human scale. In the old days, we had a scale for people. And now when everything was big and the focus was on buildings and leftover space, the scale was completely blown and it was always too big and too far apart and too windy and whatever, not pleasant at all. All this happened really in big scale after 1960, where modernism was rolled out worldwide. At about the same time, we saw the car invasion really taking speed and the cars were filling. They were filling all the spaces in the old cities and they were also, uh, they were, they were, they were also the background for everything new being built. They were built on the conditions for the motor car. And in this, this transformation, again, the people were chased out of the city. So people were hit from two sides, from ideology and from the motors. People are treated today in cities all over the world very badly by the motor cars. This is from Romania and shows a few little problems there. But it may be big problems here and there, but the worst problems I've found with the motor car and, and the people we, of course, find in the developing world, in the third world, um, where conditions for people are more and more unacceptable because of the pressure from the automobile invasion. All this really happened in the big scale from 1960 onwards. And we may ask, what did we actually knew about quality for people in cities by 1960? And the answer is we knew virtually nothing. Then we heard just at the same time from 1961, we heard a strong voice from Manhattan in New York, Jane Jacobs, architectural journalist with Architectural Forum. And she was living in Greenwich Village and there was this big plan of transforming Manhattan, taking all the old areas away, including Greenwich Village, and making a fantastic new city with freeways and high-rise buildings. Jane Jacobs fought this very much, and she actually won with her fellow citizens. And she published this famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, in which she formulates that if the modernists and the motorists, if they are to form our cities, they will not be great cities, they will be dead cities. And she also said to <clears throat> the planners and architects, look out of the windows and see how life really is 
instead of sitting in your studios <coughs> and speculate about how it could be changed in this way or the other, look out of the window, learn by from the people and see how people use your things. Jane Jacobs, of course, now is, she's the godmother of humanistic city planning. She's, re, she's regarded as a big guru. She's got, she's as high as anyone can get. I saw in Toronto this, this, this uh, lamppost with referring to Jesus, who was looking after the end of time, while Jane Jacobs is looking after the future. That sounds good. I will tell a little bit a story on my own life because that is embedded in this fight against modernism and motorism. It was actually a reaction to these things which started very strongly around 1960. And that was exactly the year when I graduated as an architect. I was trained in the 50s in School of Architecture in Copenhagen. And what did we train in the 50s School of Architecture? We trained to be good modernists we trained to make, to hang over the models in, in, in five kilometer up in the air and put down objects and organize the objects in nice pattern. And if the pattern was nice enough, we, we gee, that's a good city. We learned that. Now I can see that it was about the worst time of all times in city planning when I got this, uh, this training. But I rushed out of school of architecture why didn't it work? Um, I rushed out to do all these fantastic things which will make mankind happy ever after. And uh, then I married a psychologist. And then we had a completely new set of questions in the house with my fellow architects and her fellow psychologists. And all the time we architects were asked, why are you architects not really interested in people? And why do you learn nothing about people in School of Architecture? This, of course, was very hard questions to answer for a young architect. And in my case, I had to go back to School of Architecture for another 40 years. I went back to School of Architecture to hear what they forgot to tell me first time I was there. The whole story about people and architecture and city planning. And it just, I went there just to find out that when they didn't tell me anything, it was because nobody knew anything. It was completely new area about well, how people used our architecture and our cities. So I spent 40 years trying to make the people who use our architecture and cities, make them visible so that we can discuss what we are doing. What I did was mostly to sit on my behind for 40 years and watch what people was doing and make notes and systematize it and put it into patterns, whatever. I'll show you a few little examples of these studies of which we have over the years done thousands of st small studies and big studies. This is just a little example. Here, the School of Architecture in Copenhagen the school moved to a new area in the harbor and, uh, and they, they called in a landscape architect to make wonderful landscape. And he came and made these wonderful lawns here with edges of cortine steel. And in the foreground, you can see the corner and in the background, you can see the canteen where you can have coffee. And then what happens when a student comes to school of architecture and can see where he has can have coffee, he goes straight for the coffee. The landscape architect had obviously thought that students move in right angles like his project, but not so with students, not so with anybody. We go for the coffee. So they went for the coffee and three weeks later, the guy had to come back and finish his project so that it will be like the people would use it. Another example of these studies are the study of the edge effects. 
we found out very quickly, of course, by studying people that the edge has a special meaning. It's a very attractive place to move. It's where you always go when you have to wait for a while because in the edge, your back is covered. And because of your senses is out front, you can command the whole space from a position at the edge. So we found that everybody like very much to sit in the edge. We know from a ball how everybody sit in, along the walls until the music brings people in to do activities in the center. But when the music stops, out to the edge we go, where it's more comfortable to stay. Then we started to wonder, will it be so that uh, ordinary people are different from architects? Are actually are architects different from ordinary people? Will architects not prefer to sit at the edge? We made a number of studies in schools of architecture, various places, and we found all over the way the place that architecture students was behaving exactly like ordinary people. Sorry. Then we can ask if architects are just like other people who designed this. I cannot answer it, but I think that I can give you a written guarantee that nobody would use benches like this unless they are desperately tired. It's against everything in the human body and human behavior, human senses. That's not the way. If you do things like this, yeah, actually, who designed this? We don't know. But who designed this? We know. That's Daniel Liebeskind. But they will not work anyway, except for skateboarders who are not invited. If you do this, I recommend you bring in some bronze people so that you can be sure that your freestanding benches and seats are used. Um, other people are not likely to use them very much. Then I started to put my, my, my observations together in little books. Actually, the first little book was called Life Between Buildings. This year, we can celebrate 50 years anniversary of this book, and it's still coming out. Actually, more copies were published in the last 10 years than in the previous 40 years. And I saw to my great joy that these studies were being now spread all over the world because so little was, was available about people and architecture. Then 10 years ago, I made a, another book, um, Cities for People. And much to my joy, I've seen it being distributed worldwide in just 10 years in 36 languages and the newest version, much to my joy, and, and I'm humble and, and honored by this, that the newest version are the Turkish version. I'm very proud to realize that all my books have been published in, in China. What I'm a little bit sorry about is that they unfortunately has had no time to read my books over there, apparently. Now, 50 years later, and many efforts in research later. In 1960, we knew nothing, but now we actually know we have enough knowledge to know how to make fine cities for people, how to improve the old cities, and how to make fantastic new towns for people. All this people knowledge is now available. The problem really is that it's only used uh, to a certain extent, but the, the knowledge is there. I will tell a little bit about what we have found in all these years. What we found is that very strongly, we can say now that we form the cities, but then the cities form us. We have a tremendous influence on the quality of life for people through the city planning we do and through the architecture we do. 
we have realized that if you work with city and site planning, you create preconditions for making people-friendly city. But by far, the most important scale is this small scale. It's a city at eye level. I'll show you an example. One of the very best public spaces in the world is a campo in Siena. Um, and we can ask this space, which is 700 years old and still works this way, wonderful way. Is this a miracle or is it a straightforward common sense? We have made over the years a number of, of criteria which you are to look for. There are something about the protection for you, for the people. There's something about the comfort of the people. There's something about the enjoyment, the scale, the possibilities to enjoy the positive parts of the climate and the aesthetic quality of all kinds of positive sense experiences. All these are important things. If we go back to the Campo in Siena and look at this, we find not that we can say 12 times, oh yeah, 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 if they've done it all. No, they've done everything fantastically. So every time you ask one of these questions, you can answer fantastic. Oh my word, gee. And when you come to the aesthetic quality, you are overwhelmingly positive. It's fantastically well done, but you have to do all the things, not only the aesthetic qualities to have a fantastic landscape for people. <coughs> Details are great importance for life in the city. Uh, we can make facades in such a way that they signalize to you, walk on, we don't want you here. Or we can make facades which are richly detailed and signalizes, you're welcome to stay around here if you like. We have a fantastic influence to to people's behavior and people's opportunities. We made also this little study of two squares in, in Norway and Denmark, two squares which were done at the same time. They have the same number of passers by every day. One has none of the 12 criteria met. The other one has almost all 12 of, 12 of them looked after. And the one with the, all the criteria and all the quality criteria, they have 10 times more life at any time of the day than the other one. The other one will be a place where everybody tried to run out of the space as fast they can, while in the good space, people come from all over the city to settle there because it's a wonderful place for people to be. So we know all this. While all this research has been going on. We had seen that there are new demands to city planning, um, which have come up because of the society changes. But some of them are old. We still need public spaces. We need the human dimension to give people room to walk and to meet. And people have always been the attraction number one in the city. That has been the meeting place of people where we got information about our society and our co-inhabitants, the people in our neighborhood, the people in our university. We got all this information from the public spaces all through the history. And that was the opportunity which was taken away by the modernists. We can see again this importance of these meeting city as a meeting place in the days of the corona when suddenly the cities were completely empty of people and we felt this enormous emptiness and we started to look so much forward to the time when we again could go back in our city and meet our fellow citizens doing whatever they were doing in their daily day doings. We can also see this interest in lively and, and the meeting of people in lively public spaces in the way in which architects always present their projects. The projects, whether it's a good project or a bad project, whether it invites people or not, they are all of them. They are just people washed. They are filled with happy people 
doing funny things which are not likely to happen. But the more people there are, the more we read the scene as that must be a wonderful project. And we all as architects use this, this trick to get our projects passed by the clients and by the politicians, people watching. We love people more than anything else. We also, in these years, have increasingly realized that we need to make much more sustainable cities. And we realize that the more we walk, the more we bicycle, and the more we use public transportation, the better for the climate it will be. But also, it will be much better for your health. We have now from the doctors <coughs> strong evidence of a new sickness called the sitting syndrome which, and they point that it's essentially for homo sapiens that we move every day and we move more and sit less. They say you shall move one hour moderate exercise every day. You will have many more years of life expectancy and you will have a better life and it will be much cheaper for the health authorities. We know all this and we also realize that for 50 years we made city planning which invites people to sit and sit and sit. Increasingly we realize that we have to make cities where you invite people to move naturally. And so World Health Organization in the action plan they say introduce transport policy which promotes active and safe methods such as walking and bicycling. Another thing which is happening now, which we realize is that we have a steadily a growing population of elderly people. They should have a good life for quite many years from the day they retire to the day they don't move around anymore. That puts new demands to city planning. And again, uh, we can use the doctors, they will say that 10,000 steps a day will keep the doctor away. So you old guys move, do your 10,000 and you architects and planners make cities for walking so that walking and bicycling is part of the natural things you, you, know, you do every day. It's the invite for this. Then we can sum this up by saying that if we look carefully after people in city planning, we will address efficiently these four issues. The cities will be more livable, they'll be more sustainable, they'll be more healthy, and they will be good cities to be old in. It's a win-win-win situation, really. Then we can ask the question, will there be cities saying, in this city we'll do everything we can to invite people to walk and to bicycle as much as possible, not only on the Sundays, but also on more importantly, every day on Mondays. And cities all over the world, they are actually doing just this now. I could take you to the city of Copenhagen, which is one of the cities we started very early on all this, and I will do that, but I'll come back to this. Instead, I'll invite you to the city of Sydney. Sydney is one of the cities where I work with Gale Architects. Sydney is famous for its waterfront, its wonderful waterfront, fantastic, but the city center is quite awful. It's full of buses and full of cars and noise and congestion, and people are having very poor conditions. We have worked very hard to push the traffic out of the center of Sydney. After hard work in Sydney, we have now just managed to get quite a few of the cars and buses, everything out. The main street is becoming a pedestrian street. A tram is going up and down in the city. And also in Sydney, they have promoted um, bicycling. What happens in a city if you chase out the parking and the cars and and introduce bicycle lanes and pedestrian systems, you become an honorary citizen of the city. Instead of being stoned and thrown out, they actually are very happy about these changes. Another city where we worked has been New York. The first thing they did in New York was 
to actually come to Copenhagen to get inspired about how to make humanize the city of New York. In New York, they worked quite a bit. Uh, but I'm going to show you this one here from Times Square in New York, where after hard work, we managed to get Broadway close to traffic and saved a lot of space for people in New York. Also in New York, to have a more sustainable city, they introduced bike lanes, a big system of bike lanes all over the place. And what happens if you take away the Broadway and if you put in, instead of parking, you put in bicycle lanes, um, what happens is that you get fine awards. Now we go to Moscow. In Moscow, we started in 2012, and but we were very shocked to see Moscow. It was completely inundated by motor cars. And um, all, this is a little side street. The other one was a little one-way street. So the city was completely given over to car traffic and parking. There were no parking rules, and a lot of work had to be done to clean up Moscow. In the main street of Moscow, the sidewalks were taken in for parking and left for the Moscovites were only one meter of space where you could walk. The air was full of advertisements and the whole street was very gray and dull. During a talk with the mayor, <coughs> Sergei Sovianin, uh, he asked, what will you suggest and I mentioned a number of things in our, our study of Moscow and said that the idea of parking on the sidewalks is not a good idea. You will have to take the parking away. And before I could almost count to 10, you come back to Moscow and all the cars were moved and there were no car parking on the sidewalks. If people forget this, Mayor had a nice little car which goes around and picks up your car and take it to a place unknown. You never know if you will get it back. Very, very efficient. Actually, they have very efficient democracy over there. But that was the beginning <coughs> of a long transformation of Moscow. Gray streets became green streets. Car parking became places for seats. And instead of all the advertisements, you can now see Kremlin in the distance. One street after the other was improved so that they, it was possible to walk around in Moscow in dignity and the cars were to a great extent. The parking was organized, much parking was removed. The, there were fewer lanes, there were bicycle lanes. And in the end, <clears throat> it, it was a completely transformed city. And when I was there last time for two years ago, they approached me and said, oh, hey, We've got a new problem now. We have got the Moscow baby boom, and it is your fault. It is to be blamed on humanistic city planning. I'm very proud if humanistic city planning can create a baby boom in Moscow. And when you do all these awful things to a big city like Moscow, what happens? Are you stoned out of the city? Are you kicked by the citizens? No, you are. You, are, you get fine medals and kisses on both cheeks for humanizing the city. Now we go to the city of Copenhagen. There was one of the first city, cities to start to do all these humanistic things, to make uh, do a lot for the people of the city. Um, it started in 1962 when they took, as one of the pioneers in Europe and in the world, they took the traffic out of the main street and gave it over to people. And much to the surprise of everyone, it started, people started to use the city in a completely new way. Everybody got very excited and they decided to continue in this humanizing the city strategy. City of Copenhagen looked like any other city in Europe at that point. All the spaces were full of parking, but all these spaces are now taken over by people and the city is completely transformed. The waterfront was used to rest the cars, but now it's used to rest the people. 
completely transformation. What is interesting about Copenhagen is that that was the first city in the world where this life in the city was studied just as closely as the traffic engineers study the traffic situation. There was made a number of big studies of how the life works in Copenhagen. So we know everything in Copenhagen about people, how people use the city, not only how the cars use the city, but how the people use it. And that has been widely used by the municipality to gradually make the city better and better and better. This is the city of Copenhagen, 1962, one street cleared of cars. This is the city, 2021. A lot of spaces are cleared of cars or with very reduced cars or with semi status of pedestrians and cars, whatever, slow cars, completely transformed city. Also in Copenhagen, which is very important, they have a strategy they know they have a vision, we shall be there year 2030, we shall be there. And to get there, we have a strategy. And every five years, we check that the strategy is followed. And this strategy of Copenhagen, which was passed in 2009 was, we will be the best city in the world for people. And some of this is now, of course, that it's not only the city center, it's a whole city we should be people friendly. All the major streets in the city has been changed from a lot of car lanes to just two car lanes, but plus three trees, plus bicycle lanes, plus a median so you can wait rest when you cross the street. And this lower street is much more safe, much more beautiful. And it can take the same amount of cars as the upper street because also the traffic engineers have learned a lot in the meantime. Another item of this people first policy is to have throughout the city, the principle of continuous sidewalks and continuous bicycle lanes. That means that it's the people who can continue and the cars will have to stop instead of the usual that the cars make the people stop. That means that my grandchild Laura of seven, she can now walk to school all the way because she can stay on the sidewalk. She doesn't have to pass any streets anymore. Also in Copenhagen, they put a lot of effort into a bicycle system and all over the city, there are very good bicycle lanes, a complete system of bicycle lanes. And that over the time has meant that we now have an alternative transportation system you can transport everything on bikes. Every third family has a cargo bike where you can roll their children to school or to sports, whatever. The major thing in a bicycle system is to make it safe. And the major thing for safety is the street crossings. Again, they have studied the street crossings carefully and made rather safe street crossings. So the system is rather safe and my grandchildren, when they are 12, they are allowed to bicycle all over the city because it's an efficient system and it's a safe system. To have a good system, it has to be integrated with the public transportation. And in Copenhagen, you can take your car, your train and with, bring your bike for free in the trains and go far distance and then pedal again. Also in Copenhagen, they have strategy for bicycling. We will be the best city in the world for bicycling. And they have this strategy to find out when to do what. What is the result of all this? The result of all this invitation for bicycling is an, an, an a steady increase in bicycling. And there's now an impressive culture of using bicycle. In 2018, 49% of everybody used a bicycle for commuting. 10 years ago, it was 38%. Of course, we now have a major problem in Copenhagen. That's the congestion on the bicycle lanes. But on the other hand, if you have such a, it's a very good problem to have, but you can only also solve it very easily just by doubling the side 
of the bicycle lanes, which is being done. Now, <clears throat> the lesson from all this work, all these studies we made, and then we applied the studies to real life cities and situations. And we have found that if we provide good invitations, you will have more walking, more public life and more bicycling. If we make more roads, we have more traffic. If we invite the people, we will have more people and we will have more sustainable and healthy activity. We have a choice, which is a very important finding. And also it's very popular with the people. <clears throat> what happens if you do all these dramatic changes to a city like Copenhagen? Well, it becomes one of the highest rated cities in the livable cities rating system. Copenhagen goes up and down, but normally among the best five every year in Monaco. What happens when you do all these dramatic changes to a city like Copenhagen? Your minister of culture reads your books and changes the Danish national architecture policy, put people first. What happens when you do all these dramatic changes to a city? They pick your closest associate to become the new city architect of Copenhagen, which is a very good omen for the future. What happens if you do all this, for God's sake, you find they put posters on myself on the bus steps or stops and on the metro doors. You cannot raise higher in any society than in your lifetime. See you, your face on the bus stops because of all the, the drastic reductions to car traffic you have made in a city. So if we ask the question again, what if architecture could change the world? I will answer, indeed, architecture can change the world. Good luck to you, Turkish colleagues, in your work. And I'm happy to know that my book now is available out in your own language and all the recipes of how to do, you can find here. Thank you very much. Ta -da. Thank you so much, Professor Gail. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, sorry for this uh, short technical interruption. Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, we learned a lot uh, during this process. Uh, but it was so lovely to listen to you, so important messages. And it's a very valuable experience also for Turkey, uh, your knowledge uh, shared with us. So uh, actually, especially in these pandemic days, I have to add, uh, it's so important your messages, designing or planning the uh, urban area uh, with people and also with the health idea of the public. It's so important and it has been proved in this pandemic days as well, uh, very clearly, let's say. Now, uh, if you allow me, we have some questions from our participants. I would like to share them with you. Uh, I will uh, actually, they have written and I will read them uh, for you uh, and uh, I will ask uh, for your replies. The first question is from Arda Beckers. Uh, he is asking, in the past, I think that buildings suitable for the spirit of the place and compatible with the environment were built. Today, many modern buildings are designed in a software environment and buildings that can be anywhere are designed like industrial design products. What are his recommendations for young architects to avoid these? My general recommendation is really to look after the spaces around the buildings and realize that what is happening in a building and what is happening around a building are two sides of a metal of a coin and you have to address both things. Generally, we address the buildings too much and whatever is not building 
we address far too little. So the really important thing is the spaces are the key to success in city building. Thank you so much. Now another uh, participant, Emre Alp Günger, he is asking, nowadays, while everyone is struggling with postmodernism, wouldn't it be a good option for architects to work with psychologists or sociologists while designing spaces? I would say that indeed, uh, multi-professional multi uh, collaboration is, is obviously a good idea. In our company of Gale Architects, there are several professions. Some of them are architects, sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, whatever. And also there are some people of modern culture education and some people trained in developing countries and all work together um, and contribute to making uh, more uh, livable cities and more improving situations, especially in developing countries. It's very important. Thank you so much. Another question comes uh, with a nickname. Sustainable architecture, yes, it's important. Architects in the industry must have certain certificates on this subject. Well, are certified architects really, are certified architects really doing this job right? Does this have a specific control mechanism? I don't think I understand. Sustainable, about sustainable architecture. Is it really uh, done uh, properly? Uh, he or she is asking. All this about sustainable architecture is really in a very early stage. We are very every year finding out more and more we can do sensibly to make a much lesser footprint on this globe with our buildings. And there's a lot we can learn in the cities and in the building industry. Thank you so much. And uh, another uh, participant, Oz Ozalp Apaiden, is asking, just a moment, uh, we are very grateful to be able to access uh, Jan Gale's book, Cities for People in Turkish. Will we be able to access the Life Between Buildings book as a Turkish publication? Do you have some good news for us? <laughs> You are welcome to publish that book if you like, and it costs you nothing. I, I give it for free um, to all the countries who would like to use it because it is, we always said we did this research for mankind, not for personal income. So it is free. You're welcome. If Thank you can you. find a publisher. Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> We will search for that. And Charlie Farhat asks, what are the problems that Jan Gale faced during the redesigning Copenhagen? The problems I think that faced. One very important figure here is that it has been done over many years in small steps. Because in the beginning, if you have told in the beginning that this is what we are going to do, you will have been thrown out of the country and out of the city and nobody will, will, will ask for it. It's been done in small steps, but now it's not, now we are not pioneers anymore. Now we know we have so many examples of good cities we can learn from that we can take bigger steps today. But Copenhagen was a pioneer. They did it step by step by step over 40 years but all the time in the same direction. Okay, thank you. Now, Nilay Evgil is asking, do you think accessibility for all citizens can be a good key feature for creating healthy cities in the 21st century? Because even today, there are people who are excluded to be a part of the city. Um, I think I would like to have that question again. Okay. 
do you think accessibility for all citizens can be a good key feature for creating healthy cities in the 21st century? Because even today, there are people who are excluded to be a part of cities. Certainly, accessibility for all, all types of people, all age groups and all kind of abilities is a very important uh, thing to aim for. But generally, if you make a city which is good for people, you find that it's also a good, better city for children and a better city for handicapped people and a better city for old people and a better city in the winter. So that if you make a, generally follow a number of rules about good city, it becomes better for all categories. But then of course you can do extra efforts for blind or for wheelchairs or whatever. Thank you. Another question with a nickname is, uh, since you are talking about human-friendly cities, what is your opinion on anti-homeless architecture we find in all cities? Yeah, <clears throat> we call it dark, um, dark city planning, um, this anti-homeless thing. And of course, the homeless question is to be addressed in the social policy of the nation or the city. And of course, um, so I think that we shall be decent, make good cities for people in general, and they will also be good for those groups. But I don't think we should uh, try to make special efforts towards that group, but we should pressurize the government to take greater care of its citizens so they don't get homeless. Okay, thank you. And now uh, the translator of the book, Erdem Erten, uh, he is asking, Dear Jan, it was a pleasure and honor to translate your book. Your career actually started when Team 10 was very popular in architectural circles. However, the Scandinavian scene was always closer to people as Team 10, as the new avant-garde was more drawn to abstraction. How did you react to Team 10, uh, Team 10 and their ideas on cities? Uh, how do I react to who? Team 10. Team 10, okay, yeah. Yes, um, and, and uh, their ideas on cities. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a general thing about a number of these teams and about these uh, groups who have manifestos. I think it's better to reason to Jane Jacobs, who said, look at what is happening and take your departure point in knowledge about the people and the city instead of sitting and have making up ideas about how it should be. Of course, it should be a mix of knowledge and vision. But we've seen with the modernists, they had a lot of visions. They never tested the visions and actually most of them did not work at all. Take care, look at the people. Okay, uh, actually Adam Ertan has a second question. Were you familiar with the Gordon Kellen's work and the idea of townscape? If so, how do you evaluate it? Gordon Kellen's work? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I think it's, it's a great work he has done. It was done in the 50s and it inspired us a lot and also inspired me personally. I think he, with his visionary or his, 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 he has a vision of the city and he's going through the city with his eyes in a most interesting way and inspires us all. Thank you. And uh, if you are not uh, very tired, Professor Gale, we have some more questions. Shebnam Hoshkara is asking, what do you think is the role of urban design education to future architects and planners? The role of the education, urban design education. I do think that it is important uh, that we distinguish between urban planning and urban design. 
I see urban design as designing the city at eye level, designing the city where people move around and designing what is close to the people in the city. While city planning is more looking after the broader issues of railway lines and metro lines and whatever, but urban design really should take care of the city at eye level, as you see it when you move around. Again, Gordon Collin could be very good inspiration here. And so could Camilo Sita, who is a city planner in 1889, 1989, no, 1889 in Vienna, who wrote this extraordinary good book, um, City Planning According to Artistic Principle, where he saw the city at eye level. Camilo Sita. Okay, thank you. And another question is uh, telling you it's a nice presentation and what has COVID-19 taught to you, sir? I think we learned from COVID-19 that people have used the outdoor spaces much more than before because when we cannot go together we go out in the parks and in the spaces and we walk and walk and walk mm -hmm. to have some fresh air. Uh, and we found that it's very, very important that we have good public spaces in our cities and enough of open air and nature nearby. We have learned quite a bit about that. Thank you, that's true. And Naz Özkan is asking, as designers, how can we conduct urban design or architecture in collaboration with the strong powers of a city, such as economics, industry, or politics? The pressure from economy is too much that sometimes our hands are tied. It's hard to meet demands of economy with the demands of the citizen. What do you think? I did deliberately show you in my examples a number of cities in Sydney, in New York, and in Moscow, where there were very strong opinions, strong policies, strong economic lobbies. But I have found that it's, imposs it's possible to change the mindset to make people understand what benefits they can have from a more people-oriented city planning. And, and I showed you in my examples how it has been possible in all these cases to convince and carry through and end up with a much better city, even if it's sometimes you have to fight quite a bit. But all this about people is very easy to have people understand because each of us can recognize that could be me, this little guy sitting on that bench. I, I would have done the same thing. And, and so, I found in my many years of work that it's very important that we work on the mindset so that people understand why we have to take the car, park cars away, why we have to widen the sidewalks, so they understand the reason. I would generally say, first you change the mindset, then you can change the cities. Okay, thank you. And Nilifer Karanfi uh, has a question. Social distancing will change the way we live, apparently. I'd like to ask, what would you like to say and foresee about the changing proxemic in the post-pandemic urban life? I don't think I understood your question. Social distancing will oh, change. Social distancing, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. And how do you foresee that uh, in the post-pandemic urban life will be the change, I mean, apparently? In 1918, 100 years ago, we had a very strong vira, virus epidemic, the Spanish flu all over Europe. People died in great numbers. If we should have built for the Spanish flu forever after, we would never have human scale. We will never have intimacy. We'll never have nice and cozy places. And I am sure that when this is a bit over, 
we will return to being human beings because there is a long biological history and a long history of human scale and where we are comfortable and where we are not comfortable. And we will not let, let an epidemic decide what we should be the surrounding for ourselves and our children. We will be human beings again. Thank you so much. And Beza Chili asks, while observing and photographing how is a bench used in life between buildings, how many minutes did you spend observing? How many minutes minimum would be needed for observing and documenting such situations? And what happened to the baby in the stroller at the end? Actually, <laughs> I, have, I have together with one of my associates, we have made a book, How to Study Public Life. All these questions about how many seconds and how many minutes and how to do it, we have answered in this book called How to Study Public Life. It came out in 2013, seven years ago, eight years ago. So I will refer to that book that has all the methods. Thank you. And Mehmet Ronel asks, what could be the impact of technology and digitalization on the urban space of the future? What are your expectations or predictions? I know there is a number of technolo technological breakthroughs and technological ideas being developed at the moment. And if we talk about automatic cars and smart city and a number of technological gimmicks, which are being developed, everybody get very excited. But we shall realize that all these things are quite expensive and it will take quite a while to roll them out. And we can question whether they will be available in the developing or in the poor economies and in developing countries where the real problems are. But what is a good advice is you can always look after people because that is almost no expense is just to use your brains and think about it. And so very little investments and it's for everyone and it's for all economies and you can start tomorrow. You don't have to wait for the technology to find out solutions for the rich. Thank you, Professor Gay. It's, uh, I mean, such an important area. So there are so many questions. We will stop uh, somehow anyway. Uh, but uh, the researchers, the PhD students, the professionals, they are asking some more about the pandemic. Uh, Ilterhan Awan is asking, with the pandemic circumstances, the idea of socializing changed a lot. People started to live in their individual spaces more because of people is social, because people are social organisms, I think architecture is responsible to change the situation. How we can design individualism, collectivism balance, balance, I'm sorry, how can we design the balance of individualism and collectivism by using architecture in the city? I do think that the answers to this question is to be found uh, in many of my books. But I will say some general things that we can look at history. Mankind and our cities have had many catastrophes. There have been earthquakes, there have been city fires, there have been wars, there have been bombing, there have been the plague, there have been cholera, there have been Spanish flu, and now we have cholera. But every time history tells us that after a while, when the bombing has stopped, we come up of the basements and start to live all over again. So man is a very resilient creature and the biological history are much stronger than a little event which lasts two or three years. I think we can learn that from history. So don't panic, don't panic. Thank you. And Aliba is asking, how can we improve our cities against modernism? After all, there is a consumption-based system right now, 
and it's not entirely in our hands to control it. How I can we improve the cities? I do think that Copenhagen is in the same situation and has a, a decent economy and has had its share of modernism and motorism. But come to Copenhagen and see what you can do. It is possible. You can change the world. Okay. Good news. Thank you. And, uh, Neslihan Kesici is asking, what do you think when you look at the approach of cities for people, cities for people, from the concept of crowd? Of crowds? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that is, that's a long question to answer. And, uh, but of course, we don't like crowds, especially if you are children or old people, they hate crowds. So there should be a decent space on the sidewalks, but other rules apply to the stadium on the football match and, and uh, in, in various events, in festivals, whatever. So there are various viewpoints, but the normal situation, if there's too much crowding on a sidewalk, you should make it wider so that people are comfortable. We even have a figure how wide it should be per hundred per <coughs> it should be one meter for every no I cannot remember it but we have you could see the book we have a figure how much space is generally needed which we have found. Thank you Professor Gay and uh, another question is about implementation has Mr. Gale or his office encountered any kind of resistance from the government bodies and city councils in terms of the requirements to change the well-established city, city policies and the need to expend more money to change the infrastructure completely? Did you have some problems with the governmental or uh, regional uh, administrations? Let's say. There are two important mm -hmm. things here. One is that what I suggest in cities are very cheap, much cheaper than anything else they can come up with. It's the cheapest infrastructure of all infrastructures. Both train and metro and buses and automobile, much more expensive infrastructure. So it's the cheapest thing which is for everyone and which is easy to implement and generally and there is a number of positive aspects associated in it. So generally, we have had the other experience that it's the government and the city councils who ask us to come and help them to do a, a humanizing of the city. We don't have, it's not my, in my personal experience, where I've not been fighting hard, people have asked me to come. So that's a good way of starting. Okay. Thank that you. mindset has been changed. Then they say, come and help us. And uh, another question is from Celia Teguia. In regards of the COVID crisis and in your work, what is your consideration for the intermediate spaces, intermediate public spaces like balconies, common spaces, excesses? Uh, how do you interpret them? What, what is your consideration, she says? The intermediate spaces, yeah. Um, we have found that the borderland between public and private is very important. That the, I talk very much about the need for having soft edges in cities so that the life in the buildings can float out and, and interact with the life in the public spaces so that there's an easy transition between private and public. That's very important, which I have a big chapter about in my Turkish book. I think uh, now it's so valuable to have your book in Turkish, uh, as, I, as we all see, I mean, from the questions and from the issues to discuss. Yeah. 
thanks to Koch University Publishing and to you and Erdem Erten once again uh, for gaining this book in Turkish. Now the last question. The last question is from Gabriel Kiu. What measures and actions do we have to take in order to transform the city's population into a lively community? I am referring to post-communist cities with relatively recent population expanses from the 80s where their citizens are not melded into any group types or any communities. This population still feel like they belong from the villages they were moved from the communist administrations. How can we transform these moved villagers uh, into real citizens? These immigrants, uh, he's asking, how, how can we uh, change them into citizens? I is think that here? much of this is a matter of general policy and uh, also specific cases. But I have found in my studies I've been so lucky that I've been able to study these issues in all parts of the world, from South Africa to Greenland, and from Japan to America, whatever. And I found that for Homo sapiens, there are very many things which are the same and which are part of our biological history. We are a species, we are a walking animal, we are all built the same way, and we have a number of things which we do in the same way, because we have the same senses and the same movements, a lot the same. So there's a lot of this generality we can use in all populations. And then there are specific things in this place or another place due to the climate, the topography, the culture, the religion, and so forth. So there are these two, the general things and the specific things. But I don't know what to do in this particular case. I'll come and look at it. OK, thank you. This was the last question. Actually, we had to stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Gale. It's actually, we would like to continue, of course, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, one thing, one thing. Uh, please. I, I heard uh, there was a question from the translator of the book. Yes, Adam. And I would, I would like to send my personal greetings to the translator and thank him or her. It's a her. Him, him. Mm -hmm. And thank him for the, for the good work, and I'm very grateful for his work. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are also grateful to him, really, and also the university uh, for uh, this big work. Thank you so much. Really, under these circumstances, we wish we were together, I mean, face to face and continue in the dinner and coffee break and whatever. Uh, but under these circumstances, still, it was so valuable to be with you, with Jana Revedin, with Marie-Hélène Pontal, because uh, there are so many issues uh, to, to be discussed, uh, to be dealt, I mean, about architecture, about society and urban planning. And uh, really, it's about uh, our new role and about all our responsibilities. As the Chamber of Architects of Turkey, we are also very much uh, interested and focused on that. I mean, for uh, better cities, more equity and more livable spaces and environments. Thank you so much, Mr. Gale, Professor Gale. It was so valuable during these difficult times. We, you spent so much time with us and uh, just maybe shortly in two hours, but still so many uh, colleagues from Turkey and from all over the world, they enjoyed that. And they had at least uh, their questions to share with you. And we will continue to think all about that and also uh, to discuss maybe more and more face-to-face, -face, I hope, in the future. You are welcome to Turkey, if it allows, I mean, the uh, pandemic. Of course, you are welcome to Turkey for a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion and conference. See you there. The next future, yes, <laughs> of course. And Yana and Marie-Hélène, it was so important to have you here because talking about uh, the architecture's uh, responsibilities and the new 
interventions and new uh, actually innovative approach, which is very important for today's architecture and also education area. It has been such a big pleasure to, to listen to you, to learn about these new uh, ways of uh, approaches. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and for your energy and for your knowledge to share with us. We are so happy and we are so grateful actually uh, as the Chamber of Architects of Turkey uh, to organize this event. And you are also welcome to Turkey in the nearest future as, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, <laughs> Denise, may I have one and a half minutes for of a course, closure? Of, of course, of course, of course, the floor is yours. I, I repeat a, a line that Jan Gehl often says when he talks directly to students. And it is such a refreshing and joyful message. And it is so different from all that we have learned still in our generation by the false modernism. Huh? That was not the modernism of the Bauhaus, but an interpretation. And you at Mimar Sinan, you know what the real Bauhaus yes. teaching and ecology was. So I, I, I was touched, Jan. I could sit under the photo of Bruno Taut, he, who was one of your deans. He was able to escape from Germany and from the Hitler dictatory. Uh, to Istanbul, the then freest city of Europe. So uh, strong, go strong, Turkey. Huh? <laughs> uh, but this line that I want to repeat, Jan, what you often say, first people, then spaces, then buildings. If you remember that, when you design, dear students, dear young colleagues, Dear all of the colleagues, of course, in Turkey, but all around, because I know that many, many have followed this uh, speech and will follow it because it is registered, so we can we can re-see it uh, in the in the next hours and days and months. Uh, Jan, this message is so easy and so simple, but so joyful and makes us enchantment of our cities, of our people then the spaces and then the building. So just follow that. Can I come with a reply? Yes, Simple. please. And so it is not, not <laughs> difficult to follow. Thank you so much, Jan. You also proved that a good designer and teacher is also funny. Humor is part of our knowledge and part of our communication. Don't take yourself so serious always. Thank you, Denise, for organizing all this for us, for our students, for the next generation, which is full of hope and full of enjoyment. Thank you very much. Could I just Thank add? Thank you. To yes, please, Professor. Yes, please. All this about first life, then space, then buildings. That is exactly how all the cities were made until modernism, where they turned it all upside down and say, First buildings, then space, and then hopefully some life, but generally not very much. So actually this formula, people, space, buildings, is the traditional formula of all the city building throughout the history until 1960, maybe. So it's not magic, it's just history, but it works. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, Marie Helen, do you have to uh, to add something? No, no, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. So we finalized with this wonderful message and contribution, and we are so happy, really, to be to have you all here and to be with you. Uh, it was short, but so fruitful, let's say, so important for us. Thank you so much, and hope to see you soon in the nearest healthy future. Goodbye and thank you so much once again. Goodbye. Goodbye, take care, thank you so much.